Hello, everybody. This is Board Game Chats. I'm Myron. And I'm Chris. Hi, Myron. How's it going today? <laughs> it's going good, Chris. It's going better than it did yesterday. Yeah. What happened yesterday? Yeah, well, um, so there's a, there's a funny thing that happens. It's around Halloween, and so I've been having snack attacks lately. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, the, 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 as the body gets older, taste, going for the rainbow, like tasting the rainbow and really going at Skittles doesn't really agree with my body anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Too many Skittles, not such a good thing. Yeah, dude. Like, I don't know if you ever watched Parks and Rec uh recreation but like uh there's this funny thing that the guy the the character that that was andy uh it was played played by chris pratt um yeah was uh he called it hot snakes and bubble gut (laughs) have you heard of that i have i've actually i've never watched the show but i've seen the the meme where the (laughs) hot snakes is not good coming out Uh, yeah yeah like that rainbow is a lie it's uh there's not a there's not a pot of gold in that rainbow. It's a pot of poop. Or something. <laughs> well, you're feeling better now. I am. I am. Drank a lot of water today. Took a few naps, and uh, I'm ready to go, man. I'm ready to go. <laughs> well, that's great. I'm glad you're all uh, sunshines and rainbows, shall we say? We're all ready for <laughs> for today's episode. We have yes. a, a really excited guest here today. Uh, we have Christopher Chung. Christopher Chung is the designer of Lanterns, the Harvest Festival, and Spell Smashers, and Christmas Lights, the card game, uh, amongst a couple others, right? And uh, Chris, welcome to the show. Did I get that right? Yeah, you can say that. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for coming we're yeah, we're absolutely. we're lucky to have you i am a huge fan of yours and of lanterns and spell smashers uh as you know we've talked about them quite a bit um legitimately huge yeah, fan yeah i, I wonderful appreciate game. it um so thanks for coming on i i guess um you know as a as a game designer do you remember what was your first game that you played like modern game, not risk or monopoly when we were kids right what was your first modern game yeah i mean i don't remember playing a full risk game to completion anyway so i wouldn't have yeah. it. <laughs> but, um, i probably played you know it's the stereotypical answer sure but i think it was Catan because yeah. um my aunt bought it for me one christmas because um she noticed that our copies of monopoly and scrabble were going to pretty much you know bare bones and losing all his pieces so i think she saw Catan on one of the um star shelves and got it for me and i wasn't sh- gonna say i was completely hooked but i knew it was different from all the other games that i have played so i wanted to figure out how to you know go about new games like this and see if there's any more games like this so i started to do a little research do a little more playing and uh, Catan was really the catalyst of that. So I have really heard a thank one that Christmas, I think it was now like eight years ago kind of thing. Very, very cool. Yeah, you really have to thank that aunt. Is, um, was she a gamer? Like, did she ever play Catan or did she just pick it up off the shelf kind of thing? I think she just picked it up. Uh, I guess she saw it then, uh, next to the other games that she would buy at kind of Walmart or something like that. And um, I, she is a little bit of a gamer. Uh, she actually has played like Scrabble pretty well and with her family they get really competitive because it's a uh they have three girls and so they try to uh beat their parents all the time at scrabble very good very good now now, do you mind if i ask uh, an add-on question to this so like your aunt was the one that got you like one of the questions i'll ask people around this time is i'll be like hey so how long do you think your aunt was like sizing you up before she was like all right i think he's ready uh she she probably sized me off from the very beginning when I was born kind of thing. Because uh, we never really played games together, her and I. But uh, like being the first grandson of the family, I think that there's some sort of like competitive nature that comes with that title, right? So you always want to be that, you know, prove to uh, the family that you have the smarts and able to, to be good at both work and at play kind of thing. Right, and, and if yeah. you're the first, you're playing with all the adults, so you've exactly, got exactly right. You've got to really hold your own, and, unless they're throwing softballs at you, kind of thing. But I will say that one of the most competitive games in our family was mahjong. 
So like my grandma was a hardcore Mahjong player. She would play with her friends and our relatives and they would play for actual money kind of thing. So if they needed a sub, my aunts would jump in. And if they couldn't make it, guess who was losing the quarters every round? That was me. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, right. so what you're saying is like, you're descended from like gamers. Yeah, exactly. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> now I've never played Mahjong and I've heard that the the game that I've played on the computer of Mahjong is nothing like the game Mahjong. Yep. Is that correct? You are correct. So okay. basically, uh, what you're playing on the computer is pretty much Mahjong Solitaire. So you're trying to get rid of all the blocks. If they match, you you know uh, that that goes towards completing the puzzle. Right. However, for Mahjong, it plays like Gin Rummy, if you know that uh, classic card game. Yeah. You're trying to complete your hand as much as possible. Um, if you uh, pull up a tile from the wall, you must discard another tile. So it's one in, one out. And you must win with 14 tiles. So basically, you have runs and sets of threes, and you have to have mm -hmm. a pair to finish. The only thing is, is that you have to draw it from either the wall itself, you have to draw it from other players, and you have to, there's kind of like timing issues when you can call tiles from other players and all that stuff. It's a really like casual game, but for where it gets complicated is the scoring. Oh. I don't even know scoring half the time. I know you can, you have uh, garbage hands called chicken and my relatives call out me uh, for claiming chicken if I score it kind of thing. They're like, <laughs> you go for more points, don't call chicken kind of thing. Uh, but if you go into Japanese uh, Rishi Mahjong, it's even more complicated. Don't even oh, get me wow. started. So really? there's there's kind of the regional differences between um, Chinese uh, mahjong, uh, Japanese mahjong, and American mahjong. So yes. there you go. Because yeah. ah. I thought I had played mahjong, and then someone said, "No, no, no, that's not how you play. That's not what it's about." And I was like, "Oh, okay." We will play a game. <laughs> I'm totally gonna be down for that. I would like that a lot. Um, it, it, what your description kind of reminds me of uh, Anna Myron's uh, wife was teaching me cribbage. Do I have that right, Myron? Yeah. And, and you played it recently yeah. too with her. Yeah, I did. And and the, the game itself is quite simple, but the scoring was, uh, I felt like I had to have like the beautiful mind, mathematical formulas in my head. And she had like a, a different name for everything. This was a double, a triple double and a yeah, triple sow a cow. Triple, triple and double. it was just, I don't know what's yeah. going on. She said, I got yeah. 21 points. That's great. Let's go on. Let's go to the next thing. But I had fun. I liked it. Right? Yeah, it, it's funny. Like, it, so like, just like with, 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 with cribbage and, and I, I assume Mahjong as well, it's all fun and games until like someone's like, yo, you know what? Like, I'll bet you like $2 I can beat you. Then all of a sudden the science <laughs> like <laughs> the right. science like comes in like you know what i'm saying yeah like like crib so like jump into cribbage she was like all right okay cool so here's how you play cribbage right so like everyone gets five cards and then uh you just call when you get the 15 and every round you try to get to 31 and that's it and we were like all right cool and like every single one of her turns she was like boom a triple boom a double i'm like how did you get these points and she's like explaining the limit break moves <laughs> on us though <laughs> like like you don't give the instructions on like the newbie players yep anyway I totally though understand. mahjong I, it sounds like an amazingly complicated game i've only seen when i was in the u.s navy a friend of anna's had visited japan and just had a spare like jade mahjong game that he gave to her wow wow yeah that now, i don't know where it is like we, we like we got it when we were like 20 so like it's i was like years ago at some point we were probably like you want you want a mahjong game and someone was like sure i'll fine yeah that's probably worth <laughs> quite a bit right now from the sounds of it yeah yep. yeah that sounds I amazing that. <laughs> well if you find it we'll have to have chris up and we'll play we'll all play it yeah can teach us heck yeah so chris why do you think – why do we play board games? Or maybe more directly, why do you play board games? That's a really good question. I think that part of me really um, – at that time, a point in time in my life, it was I was kind of at a crossroads kind of thing. So basically, I'd, I've almost finished university at that point. I was coming off of my diploma at Seneca, and um, I was finishing my d degree program at Ryerson. And I was like, okay – 
I wanted to make friends somehow, and I had friends in my programs, whatnot, but never really, you know, the casual kind of friends. Um, it wasn't until I actually was dreaming that I made a board game in my dream. I knew I was dreaming at that point. And in my dream, I was having fun. My playtesters were having fun. And I actually didn't like clue in as to what my dream was about. Cause like, it's a board game. Like, how do you make a board game? Right. Yeah. But then I started writing down all these ideas that I had that I knew I was dreaming about. So I wrote down whatever I could remember. I took the next like six months almost to prototype that game. I even like stopped university for a little bit just to go on a little hiatus. Oh, yep. wow. so, you know, it took me a little longer <laughs> to finish my Chris. degree. Right. Yeah. That's um, awesome. Not to say that this game would make me a lot of money, but you know, I was heavily invested in it yeah. and it sucks. And it sucks. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's how I really got my design job started. But for me, at least keeping the, um, the friendship uh, kind of attitude in mind, I really wanted to, have my own pocket of friends in which I can, you know, socialize with over board games. And at that time, like Catan was starting to burgeon up and all that stuff. It was really like a a pinnacle of Toronto just gaining more and more um, recognition for being like a, a mecca for board games, like with snakes and lattes and all that stuff. So that yeah. point in time, it was it was really an opportunistic uh, point of view. And then obviously, like it started into and snowballed into a, a design career quote unquote but yeah it, it's sure. all thanks to that dream i guess yeah and your aunt you owe your aunt big favor yeah. Yeah. i do yeah, dude. Um, i haven't seen her because of lockdown i know i'm dating this episode but uh oh, because we're cool. in a pandemic i haven't seen it in uh for almost uh, two years and that's wow. crazy because we actually used to live with each other so wow yeah gotta change that as soon as you can eh of course yeah so it, you actually brought up a really good point. I mean, Toronto, uh, you know, I, I no longer live in Toronto. I live about an hour outside of Toronto. and uh, But Toronto is really lucky. Like we, we have a huge, huge board game community. And I do, I talk to people all over the world about board games. And yeah. I do hear from several people like oh we're really lucky in houston or wherever I, okay mm -hmm. now people from houston are gonna write please people in houston don't write me yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I have I no mean, idea i was using it as an example no, uh we, but we no have a are... really big community and you know we're really lucky here and i just keep thinking i've never said this to any of them but i keep thinking it can't be as big as it is in toronto because there are so many game designers there are so many board game cafes and so many board game design play testing kind of events and nights and proto to and tabscon i guess the only thing that we don't have we haven't had until recently is the big convention and now we have breakout toronto which is in its fourth or fifth year it's hard to tell because covid has canceled uh, a lot of things but um go ahead myron well, l let me ask you this question. Like, so I moved here in 2018 from Chicago, and I thought that Chicago had a big gaming scene. And I mean, the gaming scene in Chicago is amazing and it's growing and it's not really a competition, but objectively speaking, there is a larger community here. Uh, and at least in my, you know, uh, in my humble opinion, a much more open, dynamic, growing, you know, community and like there's so many designers that you just meet designers like i never met a game designer particularly so anyone with a successful game when i was in chicago and i when mm -hmm. i was there my entire life until three and a half years ago and so a question i have for both y'all is this what is it about toronto that 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 creates this kind of community yeah excellent question um i think it's well, I guess we're really a multicultural kind of city, and for entertainment purposes, we can always go to theaters and you know catch the Leafs game if it's not four hundred fifty dollars a ticket. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I guess we wanted to find a another alternative in terms of like um entertainment. And so when Ben decided to adopt the uh, cafe idea from Germany, I think he was in Essen at one point, and he was like whoa, board game cafes are big in Germany. Let's try to bring that to Canada. 
So I think he was the one who kind of like pioneered the idea for Toronto in terms of having a barking cafe. Just to clarify, Ben is uh, the owner of Snakes and Lattes, which uh, he started here in Toronto. Toronto now has two or three Snakes and Lattes locations. It has three, and then he just opened one in Guelph. So I guess Guelph would be like uh, the GTA one. Like as the well. larger, greater Toronto yep. area. And exactly. now there's one in Tempe, is that how you say it? In Arizona yep. as so, well? So he's branching out. Short, definitely. Yeah. 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 So that's who Ben. Tempe. Okay. Yep. Sorry, continue. I interrupted you. I just yep. wanted to clarify who Ben was. Oh, good. Yep. Ben's a, Ben's a really good guy, Ben Cassini. So definitely his, his story is very interesting from what I can tell. Um, but yeah, no, it's, um, I think because we all want a, an entertainment that wasn't just going to a coffee shop or a Leafs game to kind of socialize, we want to do something with each other in a, a positive manner. And plus we have different regions of the uh, world kind of, uh, represented in, in Toronto as well. And I know like to the, the point that Canadians, I guess, a little bit more friendlier in mm-hmm. terms of ways kind of thing. Um, we kind of get along with each other uh, regardless of who we are, where we come from and what nationality we are, et cetera. So yeah. And board games are a nice avenue for this because there's a lot of games that fit different audiences, fit different uh, people's playing habits and what they like and what they don't like, what they grew up with and all this stuff. Um, Yeah. And I think that Toronto is because as well as it also fits a lot of um, uh, geographic kind of um, features as well. We have a lot of people within Canada are, are segments of different cities. So like Toronto's a big Mecca, Vancouver, Montreal, um, you know, going forward. But like we we are one of the biggest metropolises in the country. So a lot of people congregate and yeah, all a whole lot of features that, that yeah. work for us. Right, for, right. From my answer really to cool. the question, I think that's an excellent answer, Chris. The only thing I would add is I feel that the community that I've experienced is overwhelmingly positive and overwhelmingly welcoming um every game designer i've met uh yourself included has been you know generous with their time uh helpful to you know other designers that i've witnessed to you know answering questions and you know signing games and really really open and honest with their information that they provide and I think that might have something to do with it. You'd kind of said it when you said Canadians are nice, right? Like we're friendly people and, and easy to get along with. That might be part of it. But I do think that the individual pieces that, you know, are the basis for the community, you know, comes down to some of these people are amazingly generous with their, their time yeah. and, and their effort and welcoming. Yeah. Um, no, that's, that's exciting. So, I I want to know as a as a you know someone who's designed his own game and and uh, a couple of games, what's your favorite game to play at this moment? Out of what? the two that I designed, or no, um, no, out of all games just, in existence, games. what's your favorite okay. game right now? Right now, yeah. Well, my favorite game of all time is Twilight Imperium Four. Oh, um, it's word. a far, yep, it's a far uh, cry from. My, you know, lanterns and spell smashers <laughs> in terms of its ways, components, all this stuff. I'm literally gonna play that tomorrow. With my my brother in law, no he way. like set time up with us, and he was like, "All right, okay, here's a video to watch." We set aside like six hours tomorrow. And he's gonna like they're gonna go through it. They're like, "All right, so like you know, Bobby or whatever has the plan. So you you come at this time, watch this video, and it's like, I just I can just hear my mind like military drums playing." I'm like, yo, like, it seems cool, but like, this is a whole production. So, <laughs> yeah. So, my question to you is do you know what race you're playing tomorrow? No, like, what? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I won't ask because I, I know the game is really big. So, we'll... <laughs> it is I... really big, but I will say that um, if you're, if you have free reign of all the, the races you're playing, and if you're playing without the expansion, pick either the Emirates of Hakan or the um, the Soul uh, Federation. So basically, the Soul is the humans. humans they yeah. seem squishy, but their um, advantages, they can produce as much as they can on a um, uh, planet. So you have a force. So they have capitalism and oh greenhouse gas. Oh my gosh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> See, 
you try to invade a uh, soul populated planet, you're not getting through his ground forces. There's no. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. And then if you play the Emirates of Hakan, they're the trade cats of the um the world. So yeah. when everyone someone wants to do trade with anyone, well guess who's a major player and gets all the, the resources for themselves? Mm-hmm. Are the they Hakan. literally cats? Yep, they're literally like lions. Oh, yep. like like nice. Skyrim. They they were so, the yeah. traders in yes. Skyrim, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Very cool. So uh, Very cool. I would say that's my overall favorite game to play. Like I've only won once, but I've played like 30, 40 times at this point kind of thing with friends. And that's <laughs> also in itself um I play with designers as well as non-designers and we chill out with a game as complicated as that because it's <laughs> it's still amazing. <laughs> so not to scare off Myron, but I would say, what do you think the average gameplay length of your Twilight Imperium games are? So starting out, I would say our play sessions have been nine hours, uh, but we have brought it down to about six or seven. <laughs> I'm sorry, Myron's brother-in-law. <laughs> you just lost Myron. <laughs> no, no. I'm going to no, be I'm like, yo, kidding. so there's a pause button on this, right? Like, yeah. can we, can we... <laughs> Exactly. You're going to have to have a nap in the middle of the game. That's fine. Yeah, it's two I'm naps. I'm sure everyone will understand. <laughs> <laughs> I know it can be a really long game. And that's probably why I've never played it. I think that's probably the number one reason. Yeah, that's so, totally fair. So we have to talk about Lanterns. Lanterns was your, your first game. Do I have that correct? You got that correct. Your first game, yeah. It is honestly one of my favorite games it's a beautiful game it's one of my favorite games to introduce to people who are new to the hobby who only are familiar with games like risk and trouble and monopoly because the the rules are easy to teach uh because it uh solves a lot of the downtime problems that people don't like about games like i gotta wait for someone on my turn no not in lanterns we all got something to do on everyone's turn and i think it introduces people who are new to modern gaming to some of the, some of the things that modern games can do like really interesting and exciting things with tile placement and you know no downtime and and, and you know set collection and all that kind of thing and uh so I, I i'm a big big fan so i i did some research lanterns actually has been published in 13 different languages around the world do i have that correct am i do you know chris I knew it was past 10, but I didn't know it was 13, so that's really cool. 13 different languages. So obviously it was published in English, French, German, Korean, Russian, Polish, Catalan, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, Romanian, Chinese, and Dutch. That's that really cool. is impressive. So I have to know how many of those boxes do you own? Uh, one. So I only own the Russian one. Uh, I still have my copy from uh, when it was uh, first produced in English, of course. But okay. I only have the Russian copy. You only have the Russian I, copy. It's the most different as well because all the uh, other editions, they're probably different sizes. So like not the traditional lanterns size right. box, but some have made it square. Some have made it um, a little bit bigger. For the cool. Russian box, it's an actual like different cover. And oh. that was like really cool. So different the, art even. Exactly, different art. Um Ooh. I think for the tiles it was the same art, but at least for the um the cover of the box it was different. I don't know why, but it was done and that was really cool. But the neat story about that is um when I saw that I was like I poked Randy Hoyt, who's uh from Foxtrot Games and originally saw my game, and I was like, Randy, I like the arts. Um is it possible where I can get a copy? And he was like, Yeah, I'll order this for you. But it took ages for it to get oh, to me yeah? um, mm. because, uh, for, uh, funny enough, he actually lives in Houston, Texas. Uh, oh, so um, he had to airmail it to me. And when it came here, it was actually slightly damaged, unfortunately. Oh. Um, I think he got it damaged, sadly, from Russia to right. to him. But um, it's still pretty uh, dang cool to see a yeah. game like, like Lanterns take on a whole new spin just from the cover art. Still the same gameplay, okay. but uh, it evokes a different feeling for sure. That's cool. No, when you cool. said damage, I thought you were going to talk about the duties. <laughs> That's <laughs> you. <laughs> Although he said it's on the house. 
Oh, it's all good. <laughs> Way to go, Randy. That's good. Yeah, so we'll have to get you copies. We have to find you copies of like the the Korean version and the German version and all these different versions. I don't, I don't know how many in my place. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. We'll save that for another time. <laughs> they could go on the walls. That would make an awesome wall yeah. art. That would be really yeah. cool. But then I guess you don't need the boxes for that. You just need the artwork. Exactly. And we could print them off anyway. There you go. So I heard that lanterns wasn't originally about lanterns. Yeah, it was about flowers. About um, flowers. So the origin story of lanterns um, is quite an interesting one in my mind. Uh, I was just out of my uh, little, um, I guess, experiments with my first game. And all my friends who I made at that fateful day at HammerCon 2012. They were like, Chris, uh, you're totally an awesome guy. You have design chops. You've got the flavor for this. Work on something in your wheelhouse. And I was like, do I even have a wheelhouse? Maybe. Oh. I don't know. We'll see. So as I started to look at more light games for a little bit of research, you know, the games back then, Ticket to Ride and Carcassonne and all those big players, I was like, okay, let's try to make one of those as easy as that could be right i'm not sure. alan moon but you know i could make a game in his vein uh so i went to this game jam uh in toronto uh, way back when and it was basically a whole bunch of video game developers and myself who's a board game designer you know i'm i'm the black sheep there i'm sure. longer people aren't <laughs> gonna give me uh you know design tests because they uh it's a whole different level uh, of playing field but you know they're like happy to see me and so when they started naming some of the, the design prompts that they wanted to see, one of them was perspective. And I was like, okay, cool. I can work with this. No, I can't. Because <laughs> how do I turn perspective into a board game? And I was I was scratching my head so so for so long. I think it was the first 24 hours out of 48 hours, I was just like brain dead. I was like, Okay, I got to do something. I got to make my time worthwhile that I stay there. So I started making tiles and all that stuff. At this time, I was, um, I guess for lack of a better term, seeing a girl at that moment. So I was thinking like, you know, romantic themes. And I was thinking about flowers because flowers, flowers. are universal, right? Mm -hmm. You yeah. always pretty much give flowers on a date or something like that. Right, right. And I thought this could be perfect. So I started putting flowers on tiles. And then it just dawned on me that perspective could be baked into this. So how you see the game is how you would play it. Right. So when you place a tile, you would get whatever's facing you, but everyone else would get whatever's facing them on right. your turn. And so from that 48-hour game jam, Lanterns was 75% done. Wow. Of course, I had to do playtesting and all that stuff, and sure. eventually we turned it from flowers to lanterns thankfully with randy's advice and his persistence but it was from <laughs> that uh, game jam that uh, that was born yeah that's amazing that's fantastic and like honestly that's the part that is that i love in lanterns that is so much fun really it's that it's not just on my turn when i'm getting cool stuff it's on everyone's turn i'm getting cool stuff that i can and play with that's that's great what a and, and that's from the the parameters of the game design challenge was yeah. was perspective fantastic exactly so how do you go from okay i've got this idea for a game and i want to get it published how did that come about so when i started pounding a pavement in order to find a publisher because a i didn't want to publish it myself and b i didn't mm -hmm. have the relative experience or i didn't have the contacts or capital go to go further with it I started asking my friends, and they were like, uh, if you can go to conventions, great. But if you can't, uh, start finding publishers with email addresses on their contact sites for the websites. If they have like a form that you could fill out, great, perfect. Send it to those. So I ended up finding a few. And, um, you know, actually, one of them was uh, um, a good friends of mine, also within the industry. And uh, they all turned me down. They're like, no. And <laughs> okay. I was like, oh. Mm. Some of them have said it was a good game, but it's not for us. And I think right. a lot of them said that the theme of flowers was the um, the culprit. 
they didn't mm. want to publish a game about flowers because they perceived it as boring at the time, which, you know, looking back at the industry right now, I mean, I don't think you can say that's a boring theme because a lot of games with um, boring themes, quote unquote, end up doing really well. Right, right. Um, so I was like, okay, you know, that works for me. Fine. You know, I'll take this elsewhere. But the game was practically pretty much done. Um, when I discovered Randy through Twitter, I had put out a post saying that I want to find playtesters of another game. So my other game was this two-player fighting game called, uh, I think it was Full Metal Contact. It was a (laughs) real-time dice-rolling game, kind of like Transformers, where you build your robot and you beat them to death or, you know, knock them out kind of thing. And you do this by rolling dice and you push a large button to say stop, and then you resolve your attack kind of thing on your opponent. I thought that game was amazing. You know, I have a couple <laughs> of friends who remember that game from Toronto. Cool. And I was like, I'll, I'll put this on the internet, see who takes a bite of it. Randy says, hey, I'd love to playtest this for you. So he, he prints it out, like fantastic for him because it's a custom dice game. So he took the time to make custom dice and um, oh, wow. with stickers and everything like that. Yeah, that's a and lot of work. Yeah, exactly right. So yeah. I was like, um, and uh, when I asked him for the feedback, he was like, "Yeah, this is a really great game. You know, this, this, this could be changed, but you know, like I hope this goes well for you." And I was like, "You're a publisher, aren't you?" <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, uh, "How much do you hope it right? goes well for me?" Exactly. So to paraphrase that, I was like, "Did you want to publish this?" Knowing that he had already um, uh, published his uh, own first game called Red Like Expedition at that point. And he was like, no, nah, I don't think this would be right for me. But if you have anything else to show me, please do. Hmm. Lo and behold, I had Blossom at that time. Awesome. I showed it to him. And he was like, yeah, I like this game within a week. He decided to sign it. But the first thing he changed was get rid of the theme. <laughs> 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 yeah. So it, it was the culprit, but it ended up working because he signed it. And uh, the, the, that's the rest of the story, I guess. Cool. That kind of leads into what my next question was about. In general, I'm um, Randy. Sorry, the Randy that we're talking about is Randy Hoyt from Foxtrot Games. He's the publisher of the Lanterns, uh, the Harvest Festival, and uh, I think he's listed as as a developer as well. Yep. And I'm wondering oh, how are. that relationship works. Like, how much say does a developer have on your game, and does that become even more when they're the publisher and the developer how does that work like what's that like yeah so i was fortunate to work with both randy hoyt and tc petty uh tc petty being the developer on spell smashers uh, but he wasn't the final publisher on spell smashers right he just works for renegade at that point okay. um so each one has a certain level of quality in which they want to contribute to a project of course randy is putting his own uh, money into the project for lanterns and so he wants to see it's uh, be the best it can of course lanterns had to do a little bit development because some of the scoring didn't work in my game um, he's decided to make it's uh, dynamic scoring versus a static scoring track and i was totally okay with that and he decided to remove some of the um, features such as uh, wild flowers or wild lanterns at the points and also he came up with the um the favorite tokens that you would see in the game right okay it's interesting that you that you mentioned features so i i'm in soft the soft the digital software development world uh and when i hear a developer i think of uh people like luis loza who are at paizo and you know that skill set is being recognized uh with words like developer because just like you said like there are systems like there's an architecture there's things that need to add up uh, there are features. There's sort of like identifying like what kind of players and what. So I'm literally just like throwing out like <laughs> agile digital technology stuff, and you're nodding on. And I'm like, okay, so 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 that it really is a developer. Like a lot like, of whoa. it. Yep. I mean, from a developer point of view, in terms of board games versus coding, I guess developer would be a little bit more hands on in terms of coding. Uh, so they're taking the code and making it you know, work for the specific program that they want to develop for. But in terms of a board game, it's mostly about taking what the designer had in mind and tweaking it such that it works for them and it works for the publisher if they work for them or if they are the publisher themselves and to see if they can refine those mechanics that you already 
originally thought of into something that's more palatable, more um, that resonates with their their player base and more approachable for a lot of people. So there's quite a bit of overlap between both developer yeah. sets. <laughs> I'll be like, that's, yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, what you said. Like, yeah. Exactly, right? <laughs> <laughs> so is that how similar is that to doing like a co-design? Because I know that you worked with Eric Lang on the Bloodborne, uh, forgive me, I can't remember the name of the expansion, but it's the Bloodborne card game expansion, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, from the, yep. Go, yeah, go ahead. ahead. And you guys work together as co-designers on that. <laughs> is that right yeah. yeah yeah i mean we can call ourselves that yep it's yeah. on the box that's designed by eric lang and chris chung yeah you know we can say that. um but that one's an interesting relationship because eric and i consider him a really great friend and he's also a partially a mentor of mine yeah. um but he was actually getting ready to go on vacation when that project kind of began uh so basically bloodborne the expansion was a committed thing that Simon really wanted to do, Simon being the publisher of right. Bloodborne the Card Game, and so they had lined up that for Eric. But he was on the tail end of just finishing up Rising Sun, so his brain was pretty much elsewhere. You know, Rising Sun is the second of the trilogy games with Simon. Like, this and is a, a big deal. A big game, a big deal, a, right. a, a big, you know, yeah. for, a franchise game for the, for the company and for him. Exactly. Yeah. So... At that moment, he was like, I was working out of his office, and he said, Chris, do you want to take on a project? I was like, sure. Uh, What's this project? He was like, Bloodborne the Card Game expansion. And I was like, sure. What? (laughs) So not knowing, like, how to design from an IP standpoint of view, but also, like, going on a new venture that, you know, I didn't really have any experience in not normally i not actually i haven't played the the video game of bloodborne oh, really? nor have i played the card game at that point so i was like whoa <laughs> this is kind of unknown territory for me but you're he jumping was, he right into me. the pool exactly right <laughs> yep, yep in the deep end um but he trusted me because he saw what i could do with lanterns at that point and decided to bring me on so when he went on vacation i took the time to uh research as much as I could on Bloodborne and do everything that I could think of in the game and what it could hold. When he came back from vacation, then I would show him and he said, yes, yes, no, no, yes, no, yes. And we refined it together from there. So I really got the ball rolling, but he presented it to me as a, a little case study for me. And it was really cool because I, it started getting me more into asymmetric games uh, because I really thought about balanced games point of view, you know, from Lanterns, right? right. It's a balanced game. I wanted to spread my wings a little bit, and this was a perfect kind of avenue for me because it was already a committed project. It was going to be made no matter what, and yeah. so I got the experience from that. Yeah, that's great. Did did you? I I'm gonna. It sounds like you learned a lot from that experience in general. So that's good. I'm glad to hear that. Exactly. Like working yeah. with an IP is very interesting because all the um, creativity has been pretty much done for you. But right. in terms of trying to make a game that much better or that much more um, cohesive or that much more um, comprehensive, as with a lot of expansions do, uh, my goal was to make something that was playable with the uh, the base game and that people could say, okay, we want to play this with the base game. We don't ever want to play the base game without it. That was my goal. And for a lot of people, that that was the uh, uh, the breakthrough to, for them. Right. Now, Myron, have you played the video game? You were familiar with it, right? Of uh, Bloodborne. Yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah. played it a little bit. I've wa- more more watched like fifty hours of people playing Bloodborne on wow. Sony PlayStation. Uh, that's why when I saw it at um uh, at the the local gaming store, um, Board Game Bliss. Board Game Bliss. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I was like, we got to try this. We got to try this. Uh, and it was cool. I mean, I, I'm just thinking, one of the things that I thought about that experience, Christopher, is it sounds like building into an IP, like with a style guide, with mechanics, is probably more difficult. Like, like you know, would you say that you leveled up by fitting it into a system and, and getting it validated by, like, you know, the maker of the system? And you're, you're probably working with more teams. It's probably like a, a production team that has to, like, actually, like, do testing on it. and. So my assumption is that 
you did more of the end-to-end stuff there and got exposed to a lot more of the, hey, if I was ever to run a team or, you know, work on larger games with more complicated systems, I'm getting a real big leg up here. Yep, you hit the nail right on the head, right? So my experience with Lanterns was really good because Beth, you know, being the artist of Lanterns, Jason Kingsley, uh, the graphic designer, and Randy, uh, the publisher, they worked really hand-in-hand and they just let me in on the, the inner workings of kind of how uh, they were doing uh, Lanterns production at that point. But I wasn't really hands-on. But when Simon, we had a team of developers because they have a big um, team down in Brazil for Simon uh, development and uh, product testing. And for Eric himself to be on that team, as well as the uh, corporate side of Simon being uh, uh, the backbone of the, the project, you have a, quite a lot of eyes on this thing so my job was really easy, but also it gave me that uh, leg up, as you said, to see how a large company deals with a project like this. Because not only did I have to answer to their fans of the Bloodborne, ex- um, the card game, and seeing what they wanted to, to be in a, a expansion, but also Sony, because right. they're the uh, owners of Bloodborne and they want to see a, a something within their product line that resonates with what they've uh, accomplished so far so it was quite a lot of eyes but we ultimately did a really good job because in my mind i think that the game definitely has a lot of things that worked for it in terms of uh, being a base game and it was a totally fine experience but if you wanted a more crushing and soul punishing game, <laughs> you needed the expansion. Ah, and that so the was expansion is better. I got exactly. it. Well, I want to give myself a little pat on the back for that. Right, right, sure. Um, <laughs> but Eric did say, like, he got a lot of feedback from his playtesters to say that death didn't really feel punishing. So that was one of his design challenges for me. How do I make the game feel more punishing? And I was like, yeah, I could do that. For sure. That's where we go. Right. Because that's who, you know, if I was looking to make death more punishing, I'd go to the guy who designed lanterns for sure. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I death really channeled. Punishing <laughs> exactly. I really channeled my um, inner Eric Lang because at that point I was testing Rising Sun with him and I right. loved Rising Sun. Uh, I th- I think out of the three trilogy games, I'll always have Rising Sun on the top. I haven't yeah. played Ankh yet, and Blood Bridge wasn't really for me, but Rising Sun just fits all the bills for me of being like such a, a tight game, but also feature like big hulking monsters that you want to recruit for your forces. Oh, and you want them all. Eric. <laughs> yeah. Of course, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's quite fantastic that way. Yeah, Rising Sun. I I haven't played Onk either, but Blood, Blood Rage is uh, still one of our favorite games. I think in a lot of ways it's it's the perfect game in and in, in, in that I don't mean necessarily that it's my favorite game or it's a game that I want to play the most, but in that the way everything is balanced, the way the theme, the way the, you know, the points work and the mechanisms, it's just absolutely seamless in every single way. But I, I, I agree with you in the, pure just funds you know i want to play a game i think rising sun is probably fills that need for me a little bit more fun i could totally see that yeah um so there's a bit of an easter egg in the graphic design of lanterns um can, will, can you tell us about that or will you tell us about that yeah so there's actually two uh, now that you mention it okay. uh so the one that really doesn't um uh what's it called uh is it apparent for a lot of people is that one of the tiles in Lanterns was a, um, a flower. And so he kind of paid homage to Blossom in making one of the platform tiles a flower. So that was really cool. Uh, the second oh, that's Easter egg. Awesome. I <laughs> right? love it. I can picture that tile too. Exactly. Right. Yes. Uh, the other one was uh, my last name. Uh, so I'm credited as an artist. I don't know why, uh, but I guess they wanted to put me on BGG as an artist for this. Awesome. Uh, weirdly enough, uh, but uh, he he said, "Chris, uh, we want to put something on the uh, favorite tokens," and we decided to put your last name because you are the emperor of the game. And I was like, "Sure, 
all right, that I'm totally fine with being the quote unquote emperor <laughs> of this uh, <laughs> mystical land, right? You know, um, no offense to any of the uh, descendants of um, Chinese emperors or anything like that. <laughs> but yeah. uh, my grandma had uh, verified my last name in writing. And so she was like, yeah, this, this will work. So it was a real, real cool moment to show her final production copy of Lanterns. Uh, wow. And then show her the favorite tokens, and she was like, "Yeah, this is really cool." In in Cantonese, of course. <laughs> yeah. hmm. So, so just to clarify, so this is the uh, the character that is on the favor tokens, the red wooden tokens in the Game of Lanterns. That's your Correct. last name. That's it yep. says Chung. In, it in says Cantonese. Chung. Cantonese? Is that right? Yeah. Yep. That's very, very cool. That must have blown your grandmother away. I bet that was a, a pretty cool experience. I can't imagine. I imagine it would be a bit of a sell to, to anyone's parents. It's kind of like saying, I'm going to be a comedian with my job. I'm going to be a game designer. It's like, what? Like Monopoly? <laughs> right? Right, right. Yeah, you're going to mm-hmm. sell Monopoly. I, I, I imagine that would be a bit of a sell. And for your first game to do as well as it has and to to have you know your family uh, name in it and stuff that that probably got you in the good books right pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah, I told you, like this is this is playing into the story, like descended from gamers. I mean, like yeah, the name is true. like crafted into the system. I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a question from a listener, and I feel like I'm sorry, but I feel like we've kind of answered part of it, but it's sort of a two part one. So I'm going to read it. Uh, it is from Cody Kute Pastine. I hope I've pronounced that correctly, Cody. Uh, she says, uh, I'm a fangirl over here. I'd love to learn what was the motivation behind Lanterns and Spell Smashers. They are both beautiful, awesome games and so, with lots of O's, very different. Mm-hmm. And then do you, Chris Chung, do you have a preference of one over the other? So I'll answer it backwards and say no. I don't have a preference for either cool. one. <laughs> uh, because they're both my babies and I love yeah, them very much. Right? There. right? <laughs> yeah, that makes um, sense. But, you know, they, they attract different audiences. Uh, so from a gateway kind of game, Lanterns is very approachable. You know, you have a lot of people who can understand the game within 30 seconds. But with Spell Smashers, I really wanted a more meteor experience. And um, uh, because I, I told the uh, um, uh, you guys about Lanterns, let's let's go into the Spell Smashers point of view. So from that Perfect. game, I was really inspired by um, this small indie game that's still on Steam. Um, it's actually by a Canadian company, I think. It's called Letters, Letter Quest Grim's Journey. And it's a spelling game where you, you are the Grim Reaper. And you're trying to defeat monsters using words. So it would present you with like 15 to 20 different letters on your grid. And you have to spell different words with them. It could be anything, really. Okay. And you do damage based on uh, what you spell. Basically, the length of the word kind of thing. I right. thought that was really cool. You know, kind of quick and cute. And I thought, huh, could I turn this into a, a board game? And I started like jotting down ideas as I would. And it kind of worked. Um, I was also looking f- to do sort of like a combat game that was interesting at that moment. So basically, with most of the traditional games you think of that have combat, you think of like Game of Thrones, where it's card-driven combat, or you ha- think of Dungeons & Dragons, where you're rolling D20s and D- D10s and all that stuff. But nothing really out there, for lack of a better term. So I said, what if you fought different characters or different monsters with your real life skills. And I'm not saying LARPing and all this stuff. I'm talking right. about TV and <laughs> within board games. Yes. Uh, let's do something that you would naturally be okay at or be decent at. I said word games. Right. So oh, that's I how thought you were gonna say wearing leather armor <laughs> and like looking good. You know, <laughs> that's that's part of that'll get you a couple of victory points, I guess. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, Spell Smashers was a really interesting case study in terms of how do I create a combat game that featured your real life skills. So that's how that one got started. And of course I had to thank that uh, that small uh, Steam game for inspiration for sure. Um, cool. But again, if I did have a, a gun pointed in my head, as Eric Lang said, I would say no deal. I just have to say that Lanterns or Spell Smashers, I'm proud of either. <laughs> proud of them both. That's excellent. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
Well, uh, thank you, Cody, for that question. That is, that's great. Um, so I know that you and fellow Canadian game designer, Daryl Andrews, the designer of Sagrada, amongst others, that you guys have kind of a friendly rivalry back and forth a little bit. Um, I with, guess you can put it that way. <laughs> some some, uh, some shenanigans uh, yes. during the recent Catanathon. Uh, well, I guess not the recent one. I, I don't know. I didn't <laughs> see that one. Catanathon events, perhaps. Yes. Can you tell us? So what? in the yeah, for sure. So in the most recent one, it did happen okay. Uh, again. So okay, Lanterns and Sagrada are two different games. They're both beautiful. <laughs> um, you know. Uh, they really did a good job, Floodgate Games, and you know very Peter true. Walken, you know yeah. all that stuff. Really good, yeah, fantastic art. Do I think Lanterns is more beautiful than Sagrada? I mean, I'm a little bit biased, but I think Vessel <laughs> did a really good job on Lanterns, you know. <laughs> so I can't really compare apples to apples or apples to oranges. Um, but one day, um, Dale on Catanathon decided to name the robber, and I quote. Christopher Chung thinks Sagrada is prettier than Lanterns. <laughs> Challenge. Gauntlet. Right? And yeah. I was like, mm, I know this is going for a good cause, but no. So I decided to rename the robber. Daryl Andrews thinks Lanterns is prettier than Sagrada. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think he's beating me in a total of donations, but uh, it's just... <sighs> I mean, both suit a different nature of board games. Yes. One's a dice placement game, one's a tile placement game. Both and are beautiful. And they're both beautiful, and there is room in everyone's collection for both games. They do different things. Exactly. They're both beautiful. They're both fun to play. Yeah. No, there you um, go. <laughs> now, I guess we should explain what Catanathon is. Catanathon is a, a, an online event. Uh, where they raise money for is it cancer, Chris? Is that yep. what it is? Yeah, cancer by awareness, playing, cancer yep. yes, by playing the game of Catan nonstop over and over and over uh, with uh, this group of friends and special guests like yourself and Daryl will come in and uh, or call in and uh, make donations. Uh, to Catanathon, and uh, you get to do things like rename the robber. So every time you say the robber, you have to say Chris Chung thinks that Sagrada is more beautiful than <laughs> and all this stuff. So it's a, it's a great event. It comes out every year. They just mm-hmm. finished one, and I I think it's in the same month every year, right? It's in October. Yep. Yeah. They try to do it for October, and then they just broke their uh, donation goal. Um, That's right. Uh, record. So I think it was thirteen thousand dollars that they raised this year, which is really wow, fantastic. fantastic. Wow, yeah, they serious Catan dollars right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they did really good. Last year was online only, uh, and the year before that, I went in person. And last year, because I'm up in a small town of Bob Cage in Ontario, the internet was not so good and wasn't cooperating that day so i wasn't asked back because every time i uh got on they i get booted off by my internet connection so but it's a great event i definitely suggest looking it up and uh donating to it next year and paying attention and subscribing if uh, to them as well um now there's also something that daryl wrote you you've had him sign a copy of you of sagrada right is that what it is I think so. I can't remember because my copy of Sagrada, unfortunately, is uh, locked behind uh, storage. So I can't really remember what's on it. I'm (laughs) sure he wrote something incriminating as Daryl would. I Uh, think I was there the day that he signed it with you, actually. And and, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if you remember this, or or maybe we could just ignore this part. (laughs) Edit this out in the edit room. No, no. Um, I I thought he said something like Sagrada is still far more more beautiful than lanterns or something like that <laughs> enjoy your game chris or something like that. <laughs> as he wrote it in probably the- yeah. I'll, I'll try to look at the cover next time i do break it out <laughs> daryl's a, a great guy you guys it's fun watching you guys uh fight back and forth over whose game is more pretty <laughs> i think that's actually going back to what we said earlier that's a good example of how the Toronto board game community is really supportive. I mean, you know, this is all done in, in just good fun. And, uh, you know, 
this kind of rivalry is fun. It's it's fun for everyone involved to kind of joke about it. Um, so you you and I, I've done a lot of playtesting with you. Uh, I play tested Spell Smashers um, quite a few times and saw it uh, change iterations quite a bit. And I've heard from uh, some of our mutual friends that there's a, a phrase that goes around that they're saying you're you're pulling a Chris Chung. Yeah. You know, do you know what that is? I, I, I do know. It took a second for me to realize what that was. So yes. Um, this would be in so... the board game design community. <laughs> so other designers are pulling a Chris Chung. Exactly. Huh. Uh, so I would have work or I would be really busy at home um, during my prototype. And I wouldn't have access to a printer or I didn't have time to uh, you know, cut my stuff or sleeve my stuff. So I would show up to Snakes and Lattes designer night when we had them in person and still be prototyping, even when I'm playing someone else's game, because I wouldn't need the time to to uh, sleeve and cut my own games. So they were like, <laughs> oh, Chris is doing that again. I'm like, well, I can't help it. I got to make sure my prototype's done for this event. Rather, I'm I'm doing it now or, or before that. And they're like, do it before that. I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, it became a, a, a meme, as it were, uh, that I would still be playtesting and uh, prototyping at any events. And it probably will be the same. Uh, this coming Protospiel North, we'll see if I'm able to uh, get it done beforehand in two weeks. But, um... We shall see. I'm not uh, being optimistic with my work schedule right now. <laughs> well, you know, I, I spoke to a few people, and one of the things that, that came out was just how prolific you are with your designs and how fast you can turn around a new idea. And And I hadn't really thought of that until I'd heard it, and I was like, yeah, I've seen that firsthand. Like, you will – get some feedback on a game and go, Ooh, I like that. That makes me think this, or I don't like that, but I'm going to do this. And like 24 hours later, you've got this whole other rule set and a whole change. And you've turned this part of the game upside down and made everything go backwards and, 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 and it works better. And uh, I think that was more a comment on just how much you, your work goes into you know, changing your games and, and play testing and, and the way your mind works. You can just do this kind of quickly and on, on, on the fly and, and you're literally cutting it out. I, I've seen you, like we, you'll be cutting it. Like, we're going to play a game later, right, right, Chris? Yep, just cutting out the cards now. I'm like, that's awesome. <laughs> you know, I love that strategy, Christopher. Like, uh, uh, like I, I see it as you complete the work at the precise moment it is necessary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, I I, I almost uh, in your world of software development, it could be agile development, right? Because <laughs> yes! I'm yes! always thinking about how to do things. Unfortunately, a lot of it has to be the last minute. But my right. brain, <laughs> my brain loves deadlines for for uh, <laughs> an odd reason. Like I put the pressure on myself to do something well if I have a timeline for. It. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know whether that's completing an assignment for university or you know making a, a new board game design iteration right um but i always aspire myself to do the best i can within my projects and i always try to do something different so for example i like to name drop vlada havato a lot because he's a designer that you would expect he's european he loves these crunchy euros he comes out with space alert and he right. comes out with galaxy trucker like different wild games that yeah. fit super different niches and then he drops a bomb on us and puts out code names yep. and i was like whoa you're such a talented designer and you came up with a party game that just blew everyone's mind like if you removed vlad Havato's name from code names <laughs> 99 times out of 100 you would probably not put his name on the box like that's how oh. prolific he is and that is attuned to his genius as a designer kind of thing so i really want to aspire to be someone who's really flexible in terms of what they design but also come up with different ideas and quickly because i'm always like dropping ideas uh like flies if they don't work for me or if they don't work for my play testers and then go forward with the ones that i think will will um, work for them or work for me as well because right. if i'm not having fun with my own designs i'll probably end up uh, junking them anyways so yeah his his just design i um uh, philosophies have really resonate with 
Cool. That, yeah, that's a good example because I think I think if you if if you didn't have his name on the box and you you got you know ninety nine out of a hundred people together and said who do you think designed this game I don't think too many of them would say Vlada Schwapel had designed it based on you know some of the other games that he designed and and you know how how punishing some of them could be um, exactly to to say yeah this is the guy who did code names like like. It sounds to me like like there are a number of like different sort of like like areas or like domains of like game design. So like what I've heard so far is like there's design, there's like the systems pieces, like 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 how the what are the what are the systems doing? Like you know like like how does the actual stuff add up? And then there's like sort of like the experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are probably other domains, but those are the ones that are that I'm kind of like hearing and. You know, as a designer, which one of those like just broad categories that I just described excites you the most? That's a Good really question. interesting question. Um, I think that I'm more of an experienced designer. Uh, not to say that systems haven't worked for me in the past, because uh, you know, with um, with one game that I'm working on, it's a very complicated, juicy war game. I had to kind of fit a certain system in there, but from a um, kind of a moniker point of view, if you want to label experience design um i think that from my perspective as someone who wants to evoke certain feelings out of my um gamer friends and you know who the audiences of who play my games i want there to be certain like aha moments so i'm Mm -hmm. very thinking in terms of uh clever plays that are not necessarily strategic because i'm more of actually like a, a tactical player and I, so my games often become tactical in nature right They're like okay this card has flipped over what do you do like how do you change your um your gameplay to fit these changing every change of conditions and so i feel like those experiences all bake into one kind of um moment so f- uh, take for instance spell smashers where uh one moment you're feeling the elation of hitting a monster and you're you're gaining its uh letter for permanent usage during the course of the game but at the next round, you're filled up with a whole bunch of wounds because you've hit this monster at the beginning, so you can't use these wound cards for your benefit. Um, there's a lot of things that players go, oh no, or haha, I can spell this word. And I was really attracted to those kind, kind of uh, things going into Spell Smashers. So yeah. very much I think about um, what my players are feeling, and if I hear like, ooh, or ahs, or like, huh, then I think I'm on to a, a prototype where I can take it that much further to towards publication. Now, cool. Chris, I hope y'all don't mind. Do, you, do y'all mind if I throw another audible sure. into the no, question? Of course, go ahead. All good. So, like, like if you if you were going to go to design, all right, okay, cool. You know that you you're in, you like to build, create amazing experience that delight the people that play the game. Like, if there was a hypothetical game you were going to put out there, and there was no limitation for time or budget, like. Who's your system designer and who's your design designer? Ooh. Okay. Like dream team. Yeah. Right. I love it. I love it. That's a really good question. I think that my system designer will probably be, probably be, huh. Okay. Let's go with Michael Schacht. Michael Schacht comes up with wow. really cool, like small card games that are just numbers, but like Colorado it's just a numbers exercise with iguanas or chameleons, right? Yeah. But that game, you, when you bake it down into like pure numbers, you're like, how did he even come up with this? So I want that sort of feeling. But I think that the person who I really want that experience to come from is someone like Eric Lang. Because I think that he can create drama decisions with very simple design philosophies Mm -hmm. so for example his game sidekicks that just came out with spin master it's a really simple game but he was able to come up with a very challenging motivation for players to um to work through so basically if you don't know the game um players have to work together in order to uh storm the castle to free their um the protagonists because they're the sidekicks so for example oh. tinker tinkerbell <laughs> from peter pan or there's uh, right. timon and pumba from lion king cool uh you have those uh those characters in movies that really add the character but they're not the main focus so they have right. to free their heroes from this castle that they're locked up in 
So nice. players work together and they help each other kind of uh, overcome these enemies that are coming straight at them. Really cool concept and fantastic uh, that Spin Master was able to come up with this with him. But for someone like um, them to work together, and I think that Eric has worked with a whole bunch of designers that have made the systems work, like Antoine Bauza that he did with Victorian Masterminds, and he's right. worked with Bruno Fiduti, who kind of does the experience. I think that Eric did the more systems for um, mm-hmm. secrets kind of thing. Um, really, like he's able to manipulate very um, uh, simple designs and make them flash. And I'm, I'm, I'm. You know, I'm an Eric Lang fanboy, of course, like working with him, but also being his friend, the kind of thing. I will say that, you know, Blood Rage is not my favorite game. Just bring him down to earth just a little (laughs) bit. (laughs) But, um, you know, he's a really good guy to work with, and I'll probably have him as my design uh, guru for sure. I I like the way that you describe that. He's excellent at creating that dramatic moment in games. That is... That describes it perfectly. I mean, even if you're not a fan of the game that you're playing or one or two of his games, it still has that dramatic decision or that dramatic moment where someone just goes, bam, and you're like, oh, wow, look at that. Yeah, that's an excellent way to I, – I've never thought of it that way, and I think that's perfect way, way to describe an Eric line. Um, well, um, so what what do you think you've learned about yourself? from games, either game design or from playing them, or both? What have you learned about yourself? Huh. That's an interesting one. Um, I think that a lot of it comes from who I was growing up kind of thing. So basically, like, my whole origin high school story was I was really a shy kid kind of thing. I was very introverted. Um, but it wasn't until I um, went into acting and drama as a uh, an art class. So basically, one of the... Um, you had to do a compulsory art credit. So it was either at that time photography, it was um, visual arts or it was drama or it was music. So music, I could sing just a little bit, but I couldn't see myself playing in a band or anything like that. Uh, Visual arts, uh, I can barely draw a stick figure. Uh, (laughs) Photography, a little bit too expensive, but also um, it wasn't really my jive. So I chose drama and acting. And it really brought myself out of my shell, uh, supposedly, kind of thing, um, yeah. or how the metaphor goes. Um, and instead of taking it just for two courses, in which you were required to do at that time in, in high school, I took it for all four years because I loved it so much. So I really wanted to make it a, a core part of my um, experience at high school. Nice. So that kind of naturally led myself into kind of games, maybe, as someone who wants to show their creativity uh, side point of view, but also being um, a little bit more uh, extroverted, you know, sharing my my experiences and being social with people uh, that started from my uh, experiences in drama. And then finally, like, um, I learned that I could help people in um, this limited capacity of mine because I was a subject expert of board games. Right, I designed my own couple of board games. I had them published, so I was, you know, I was giving advice to a lot of people who wanted to get into board game design. In terms of people in Toronto, that me as Nixon and Lattes. But when the um, pandemic happened and lockdown happened, I started switching my focus into helping people outside of Toronto. So mm-hmm. I started um, helping out with the tabletop mentorship program, um, fantastic program. And so they start getting a lot of designers who really want to. Uh, uh, start getting into design, like maybe they have an idea or two, maybe they want to seek a publication, etc. And that would help them get towards their goals, all the awesome. free of charge kind of thing. Yeah, awesome. And like these are pe- people that never have designed a game before. Yep, pretty much uh, new big designers who have only uh, started design, or maybe they uh, have a design to kind of in their basement that they want to uh, brush up and. You know, get to market. I would help them. Very good. Uh, how did you get involved in that? I've never even heard uh, of it. It's a tabletop mentorship program. Yep. So basically, they they reached out to me because I saw their Twitter post. That was it. <laughs> they really needed designers who um, had some experience in getting a, a game to market. So I, that's I awesome. Fit the bill. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Twitter is uh, it's a big thing in in your world for sure. I mean, it's connecting you with publishers. It's connecting you with the tabletop mentorship program. 
Why, why was getting involved with the tabletop mentorship program? Why was that so important to you? I think that's um, being social in the time where we're all uh, facing adversity in terms of lockdown was very important because I would spend a lot of hours on Twitch and that also helped me in a way because I started getting to, into chess. So mm. from my experiences watching Queen's Gambit, Queen's and, Gambit watching, yes. right? <laughs> and watching some of the Twitch streamers play video games, but also playing chess, I started getting a little lonely and said, like, you know, we're, we're head deep into this pandemic. How do we see the world going, going through with this? And so a lot of people would connect online. Uh, I would still have playtest sessions with um, people in Toronto, of course, over online and tabletop sim do later. And that was all good and all. But uh, being able to help uh, designers, you know, also uh, within this landscape of a pandemic, how do they make their game that much better to be able to take it to the next step while this global uh, phenomenon is going on? I was I wanted to lend my experience to that. So, yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. And I think that's that impulse is that impulse in, in my experience is in the, in, in the endemic of or very similar to, you know, that community that I talk about when I came to Toronto, I saw there are a lot of people in the community that, that just truly want to, to give, ba give back and to create a great experience. Um, you know, speaking about lanterns, you know, it, going back a little bit, uh, that was the first game that Chris brought over to when, when he and his wife uh, came to meet my wife, Anna, uh, when, when uh, Chris and Sherry came over he introduced us to lanterns right there on the spot. And there's just so much goodwill and energy going back into both the designers in the community, as well as the people in the community. It, it's really heartwarming for me to hear that, you know, like during the pandemic, you're like, you know what, hold on a second. Let me just, let me yeah. just get, get with the community because we're probably all going through this. I'll give back in my own way. And maybe that's going to help me at the same time. Of yeah. course. Yeah. Yeah. That's excellent. No, it's really cool. Yeah. Is there a website for the tabletop mentorship program? Do you know? I believe they're just going on a little hiatus, uh, but uh, you'll be able to still find it online. And I'll, I'll send on, it on Twitter, you anyway. Anybody who's interested, that's the tabletop mentorship program. Um, so I have just a couple more questions. I don't, I don't know if you've got more, but one I wanted to know was uh, tell me about a game that you'll never play again. <laughs> all right i think i knew uh this one was coming uh so <laughs> stefan felt over here <laughs> stefan <laughs> felt is a very good designer like i no question about it i would agree i really love um his uh dice game that didn't really um get a lot of hype uh it was called roma really good game it was just placing your dice after rolling them into certain uh one two six columns and then you replace cards to build your engine but also attack your opponent. So it was a two-player game, really fantastic game that fell under the radar by Queen Games. Uh, and I thought, oh, I would love more Steffenfeld games. So I started to play a bit more. Um, you know, some were fine. Some were just way over my head. Um, Glass Road being one of them, just I could okay. not understand what a Rondell was. <laughs> Still don't. Um, but okay. one of his games that um, Bruges stuck out with me really well. I really loved that game. I was able to find, uh, find a copy, thankfully. Uh, but the game that didn't resonate for me was In the Year of the Dragon. Uh, mm -hmm. In the Year of the Dragon is a very punishing game. Uh, basically, you would commit your resources and time into doing something very well. And then you have certain things that happen during the course of the calendar year. And to me, I was like, it's a Chinese theme. Like, I would love this game. Um, <laughs> what's there not to like? Uh, imagine that you were a player on the opposing soccer team and you had to face the incoming ball like you were one of the, the people guarding your goal, yep. that happens every <laughs> single round. And you know that the ball is coming towards your face, but you had to plan for that. So the game was not necessarily trying to win in terms of have, maximizing your, your output, but it's how to win mitigating all the negative effects that go on against you. But this mm -hmm. happens to everyone. So everyone's doing this, uh, trying to uh, uh, plan for these effects at the same time. But if you haven't played the game before, you're spinning your wheels. And so I was 
I was, oh my gosh, I was audibly upset at this game. Like, I was, <laughs> I'm upset. Yep. Um, the people who I was playing with, I felt bad for them, but I was like, no, I'm not having this. And it's probably one game that I will try to stay clear of. But Steffenfeld is a very, still a very good designer, and um, he's come up with so many fantastic crunchy rules. Um, I will still try to find a lot of his games to to try and play one day, and especially because I love point salad games a lot of the time, uh, his games would naturally speak to me. But that one, didn't. that one felt that fun. one didn't. I, you know, that's one I've not played. I uh, the the one everyone knows and, and most people, many people have played the Castles of Burgundy. I love that game. Uh, and and my personal favorite is the Oracle of Delphi. I think I'm saying that. I really like that one a lot. Yeah. Um, and then I've got a couple that I just haven't played. It, it, they can be a little bit intimidating at times to get through the rules and, and go from there. But uh, yeah, no, they're they're all good. He's a good designer. I do like him. So we have to say good things about him, too. Of course. <laughs> good he things, Sandwich. Yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's really good. He designs a lot of really, really good. Exactly. Um, so what's next for you? What's next for Chris Chung? Christopher Chung. Good question. Um, right now, I actually can't say a lot of things about what's going on. Um, there is a couple of things that I have committed to. However, a lot of them have to be secret for now. That's fine. Um, so these are games <laughs> that you've been working on, is what you're basically Correct. alluding to. Exactly. And, and all the details cannot be talked about. And And can we pluralize it at least and say there's... There's games on the horizon potentially. Pluralize, yes, we cool. can we can say that. Cool. And uh, anything else? Any cons or anything that uh, that you'll be attending or doing? Uh, so I'll be doing the uh, Protospiel North, and I'm glad that this comes back. So basically, it's a uh, three day event in Toronto in a little Polish war academy, um, kind of like a memorial place uh, off the. Uh, one of the streets in Toronto and it's a really neat event because we're all just designers and uh, there are some outside playtesters too who can actually drop in and play test games kind of thing but we're all just trying to make our games that much better and because of the pandemic we haven't had that uh, event in two years so it's, it's nice to have it, see it come back uh, so I'll be attending that in November and then going forward I think I'll be at uh, hopefully Breakout Con in March if that happens as well as um if you know the work schedule has allowed me to and then finally the uh gathering of friends in april i definitely want to go fantastic you so you are going to the gathering of friends i'm hopefully committed i've got okay. my ticket purchased Excellent. Oh, so, so Excellent. chris dropped that extra casually by the way <laughs> you know. i'm just saying i'm just saying, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know and I mean, then this, you know, <laughs> that's yeah, fantastic. Friends, you know what I'm that's saying? Like, <laughs> so <laughs> let's just go through them. So Protospiel North is a uh, board game design convention. How many days is that? Uh, three days. Three days, and that's in Toronto. Um, and that is made up of playtesters and play, de- uh, play game designers. And you guys are playing games that are not published yet, basically. Correct. Exactly. Uh, and then you mentioned uh, Breakout Toronto, which uh, is in March, usually uh, when there isn't a global pandemic. And that is uh, Toronto's very large con. And uh, that's in held in downtown Toronto, and it's I believe three days. Yep, it's three days. I well, know, or it could I, be four days, actually. Yeah, I actually work on the program, so I should know this. <laughs> it might be three between three and five days. And yep. uh, sorry, sorry, breakout, sorry. Um, <laughs> and it's a fantastic event. Uh, they have thousands of people arrive. There's all kinds of you bring games. There's a game library. There's game giveaways. There's contests. There's uh, workshops to attend, uh, things to learn. There's auctions and silent auctions and all kinds of things. And there's a geeky goodies booth. There's a selfless uh, or mm-hmm. shameless, shameless self promotion there. There's a geeky goodies booth where we yes. sell t shirts for board gamers there. And then, yeah, last thing that you explained was the gathering of friends. And the gathering of friends, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, that is uh, it's a, an exclusive event for. Uh, in the game board game industry, and it's put together by Alan Moon and, and some of his team and friends. Is that correct? Yep, basically yeah. Alan and his wife um, 
have put on this little convention that have gone on for decades, basically. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's an invite-only event. Um, invite so only. I was able event. to... Exactly. I was able to network with a whole bunch of people, and then they decided to put my name forward. So nice. I got a little I'm lucky. I'm so happy to hear that. I know that uh, you've been wanting to go for a while, and I've been uh, cheering you on from the sidelines, hoping that someone would finally nominate you. And I know that they, you know, like all conventions, had problems during COVID, and couldn't do it and stuff. So that's good to hear. And that one is, I'd say, mostly industry for people, but there's a lot of people who are they're just, you know their their reason for being there is they're just like games and yep. uh yeah yeah that's uh sounds like an interesting fun event <laughs> but uh cool that's that's a lot going on for the next uh year or so that's good and uh we look forward to hearing more about your games can oh, yeah. where where sorry myron did you have something else no no i just said oh yeah 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 i, I can't <laughs> wait to see what you're coming up with uh next because of covid and because of me moving out uh, outside of the city i feel like my uh play testing of chris chung games has fallen off quite a bit uh so i have no idea what's coming down the pike really i i've, I've play tested a couple online but I, I don't know we'll have to see um and you're sworn to secrecy on and this. i'm sworn to secrecy <laughs> which i would never tell anyway i'm just saying i have played some but i'm sure there's more that i'm not familiar with at all and i'm excited to find it so um where can people find you fans of uh christopher chung or maybe hopefully you poor board game publishers who are like oh that guy i love that game lanterns i want to publish all his games where can people find you reach you and uh ask you questions about you know what you uh how you design games or uh sure so i'm self admittedly admittedly terrible at managing my facebook page so uh, i have a post from 2016 and i haven't updated it since <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> you, i can still be reached there um, you are uh, on facebook okay right i am on facebook uh you can get to my page at c chung games uh, on facebook and then on twitter i am also c chung games uh, but more so, I, I just like Twitter a little bit more just because it's more um, form-friendly and just, you can jump in and out of different conversations and all that stuff. Um, and it's a really good place where a lot of designers and players and, and uh, reviewers and everyone, publishers, everyone under the sun has a Twitter account that they uh, they right. re can be reached at. So yeah, it's uh, it's a good platform still. I think at least, you know, knock on wood. So it's still, publishers, yeah, yeah, it's right, still if working. Publishers want to, yeah, it's still working. Uh, if publishers, publishers want, want to reach you, that's the best way, Twitter? Yeah, I think that would be the best. And then um, obviously I I would love to to connect with them also via email, but uh, you can start with a Twitter conversation first for sure. And what about fans, people who have like a, a rules question or uh, I want to ask you something about Spell Smashers. Why did you do this? What did you do? Or that kind of thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you can still reach me on uh, Twitter that way, or if you want to, um, I am occasionally on Board Game Geek, um, so you can reach me at uh, Chris Derical, so C H R I S T E R I C A L uh, on Big Board Game Geek, <laughs> um, or if you can like basically that, click my Chris right, uh, oh. you can click my name on my product pages, and I'll be able to, <laughs> to get in contact with you. Of course, I'm not probably not uh, checking. Uh, BG on much, but uh, yeah, I'll still be there. I, I like that. I guess I can't steal that, even though my name is Chris. <laughs> Chris Derrickle, I love it. <laughs> well, Chris, thank you so so much for agreeing to come on. It, it's always fascinating talking to you. You're always generous with your time and the information that you have, and uh, sharing your experiences. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan. I tell you this every time I see you, and. Uh, I always steer people towards you and to lanterns and spell smashers. I'm a big fan. And I just want to say thank you so much for coming on. It's been fascinating uh, to get a little bit of insight into how you design the games, what your motivations were and your experiences. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah thanks, thanks so much, Chris. Thanks. Like, for I learned a lot today. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad. Too. I'm glad. Me too. And, and, like you and I have talked about a lot of this stuff a lot of the times over the years, and I feel like there's still new things that I'm hearing for the first <laughs> time, which is excellent. Uh, it's fantastic. So thank you again. No problem. We'd like to thank Stephen Sauer, Erica hayes Buyoris, and Daryl Andrews for their assistance with research for this episode.
Thanks for listening to Board Game Cats with Chris and Myron. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast, check out their website at boardgamechats.com, or drop them an email at boardgamechats at gmail.com. You can also find Board Game Chats on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter.